Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is a companion video. What are companion videos? Well, I'm awfully glad that you asked. See, every day on the John Campia Show, Monday through Friday, we take the second half of the show, take your live comments and questions. However, we normally don't have enough time to get through all the questions that get sent in. But if you sent in those questions and tips to support the channel, I want to make sure you don't have to wait too long to get those questions answered. So we gather them up and we address them here on companion videos. Now, we are a little bit behind because on today's show, uh, we had so many topics come in that we had to discuss, and then we had so many comments set in that we didn't actually have any time to get around to the questions. So we are a little bit behind. We're going to get caught up on a whole bunch of them right now. I'm going to let you know, though, if you do want to send in a question to be read on the John Campus Show or a companion video, you don't have to wait until the show is live. You can send them in anytime, 24-7, by simply going out down into the description of this video, and you'll see a tip link. Just click on that there, or enter it in manually at www.streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. You'll be getting your question read on a show if, of course, we deem your question appropriate to be used on our show. And, of course, you're supporting our channel at the same time, and all of us involved here at the John Campia Show, thank you guys very, very much for your support. All right. I just got done watching some Monday Night Football. It was a great game. Patriots look out. I've won seven in a row. Anyway, let's get over to your questions now, shall we? We're going to start getting caught up here with Austin A., who writes, Hello, John. Going on the assumption that the uncle is, in fact, Kingpin, Vincent D'Onofrio, and also assuming that he will be in the MCU for longer than just Hawkeye and maybe No Way Home, the actor is 62 years old. How long could he possibly play Kingpin? Fair question. First of all, it is kind of weird to think about Vincent D'Onofrio being 62 because he doesn't seem like he's that old at all. He looks great. But I would say this. His main thing that he has to do is be physically intimidating looking, be menacing. And he does that as Wilson Fisk really, really well. We saw that in the Daredevil series. And it's like, we don't need to see him pull off all sorts of martial arts action moves. Like he's not playing Shang-Chi, you know what I'm saying? So I think... He looks great in the role. I think he can continue to look great. His main thing, he's got to come across as physically imposing. And I think he can do that for another 10 years. So, yeah, I mean, I think somebody asked this earlier today, too. But, yeah, I think he's great for the role. And I don't think his age right now is, I mean, if he was 82, maybe. But right now, I don't think his age is a detriment to him at all. All right. Next up. Thanks for sending that in, Austin. We've got Wes Maurer who writes, Hey, John, woke up this morning on Friday, so this came after Friday's show, and saw that uh, Marvel posted some villain character posters on their Instagram page, and Jamie Foxx's Electro is actually wearing an arc reactor on his chest. Uh, thought that was interesting to have. Uh, interesting. Have a great weekend. Well, we actually did talk about that on Friday's show, and we did take a closer look. Now, look, it does look like an arc reactor. There's, there's several things about it that clearly make it look like an arc reactor. I'm not going to assume that it is, though. It might just be a design choice, but it could be like in whatever universe this Electro is from that he also battled Tony Stark and maybe stole some of tech, uh, Stark's technology. I don't know. Or maybe we're going to find out it's not an arc reactor at all. We'll find out soon enough, but that's a very, very good catch, Wes. Well caught. All right, next up. The Sock writes, one of two. I, I saw the newest My Hero movie, I, I assume you mean My Hero Academia, uh, in theaters, and sitting next to me was a girl and younger girl who I assume was her sister, and I could see they have a great relationship. In the movie, one of the side characters had siblings that they were that he was very close to, and that was raising, and was raising, I should say. I don't know. There was just something that moved me about watching in real life and then seeing it portrayed on the big screen. All right, thanks for sending that in, Sock. And listen... That is one of the magical things about movies is when you see the art touching real life, not reflecting real life, but touching real life. I still remember this great moment. It was shortly after Wonder Woman, the first Patty Jenkins Wonder Woman movie came out and seeing this one video of this little girl so proudly wearing a Wonder Woman costume, right? It was the first time in the modern era of comic book movies that we had a true female hero and little girls could see you know, somebody like them portrayed up on the big screen. Now, whether that's in great, or go go back to the last animated movie, I think the last movie I saw before the pandemic really shut things down, which was the animated film Onward with uh, Chris Pratt and Tom Holland doing the voices. You know, in that, they're just trying to recapture one last day with their father who they had lost. And my wife, Anne, watching that, she had not long before that lost her dad. 
And then having art touching her in her real life is a very moving, very magical experience. And I love stuff like that. So I'm glad you were able to experience that and see that in the theater there, Sock. All right, next up. The Sock also writes, Also, I saw the newest trailer for West Side Story, and if there was ever a trailer that screamed passion, it would be that one with a capital P. Again, it's it's weird. Even though it's being directed by my all-time favorite filmmaker, Steven Spielberg, it is not a movie I've been looking forward to. But the early reactions to it have been... Well, frankly, the best early reactions I've seen to a film all year. So I'm kind of looking forward to watching it now. All right. Next up, Jose, uh, Jose Q writes, hello, love your show. Thank you so much. I get my movie info from you. Congrats on your show. If Toby and Andrew are actually in No Way Home, you think they might show up at the premiere? And if they do, that's going to be a spoiler. Well, here's the thing. We have seen other movies where surprise, like at an X-Men movie, at Shang-Chi, when Ben Kingsley, you know, was appeared on the red carpet. We've seen that happen several times where a surprise appearance shows up. But who cares? Who cares? It's not giving away anything important in the film. And at this point, everybody on the planet, like for a year, has known that Toby and Andrew are going are going to be in this. And if they haven't known for a year, they certainly knew once that video footage of Andrew Garfield on set leaked. So everybody's known forever. They're going to be in it. So it's not important. I mean, again, I talked this morning on the show, about what is really a spoiler finding out that some surprise cameo is going to be there. That doesn't affect the movie at all. I, I think a spoiler that can actually alter your enjoyment of a film is something like the end of Citizen Kane with Rosebud, the end of Usual Suspects with the true identity of Kevin Spacey's character, the end of Sixth Sense with the true nature of Bruce Willis's character. Like those things, if you find out those things, it completely fundamentally alters the way you watch the entire movie. That's a spoiler. At some point, this guy shows up. It might take away a little bit of a surprise, but it doesn't fundamentally alter the way you see the movie. So whatever. But on top of all that, everybody knows there. There's no question. There hasn't been a question for a long time. So I think they can show up at the red carpet. And it's no problem. All right. Thanks for writing that in, Jose. Appreciate it very much. All right. Nick Pop Rocky writes, sending warm wishes from Pittsburgh. Home of one of my all-time favorite hockey teams. I mean, my number one all-time team, obviously, is the Toronto Maple Leafs. But for a long time as a child growing up, I used to follow the uh, the New York Islanders. And then for the longest time, other than the Leafs, the che- team that I cheered for was Mario Lemieux and the uh, Pittsburgh Penguins. So, yeah. And, and then now they got, you know, Sidney Crosby, who's from my hometown. Um, at least the town I was born in. He's from Halifax as well. So, Yeah, love Pittsburgh, man. Anyway, happy holidays, John, Ann, Kim, and Ray, and everyone else involved in the show. I was so inspired by this community's generosity this week. There's so much good in our world. Thanks, John. And of course, what Nick is referring to is the um, the adopt a family program we did this year. This is something Ann and I have now been doing for eight years. But never have we asked you guys to partner with us. We we always just every year we bring it up to ask you guys to adopt a family of your own. But this year we were so moved by the adopt a family story that we invited you guys to participate and the response was overwhelming. We're going to do a video about it in the coming weeks, but uh, I was absolutely moved by that, Nick. Thanks for pointing it out. All right, next up, Leviathan EXE writes, how big of a role do you think Venom will have in No Way Home? Can't see how they'll have space for him in this movie. There's tons of space. Uh, But at the same time, I don't think they can do what they did in the Venom 2 post credit scene and then just sit on it for several years. Yeah, look, I absolutely believe Venom's in this movie. I mean, we all, I mean, if you saw the end of Venom 2, you know he's going to be in this movie. I don't think it's going to be a major role, but it's not just going to be a short cameo either. I don't believe it's just going to be some kind of short little cameo. And there's plenty of room in this movie. Plenty. But John, you you might have three Spider-Men and you got Doc Ock. And, okay, okay, yeah. How many characters were in Infinity War? How many characters were in Endgame? How many characters are in any, I mean, just go back to the, to the movie that really birthed the modern comic book movie, X-Men. That was really the movie that birthed the modern movement of comic book movies. How many characters did that movie, did that movie have? Tons. There are, there is, look at, uh, freaking Eternals. You didn't just have nine characters. You had nine lead characters, right? Or 10 lead characters, whatever, however, depending on who you want to count, but There is room if you tell the story properly. 
You can have three characters make it feel like too much if you don't handle the story right. If you handle the story right, you could have 12, 13, 14, 15 significant characters and it can all flow perfectly. It all depends on how it's held. So I'm going to guess Venom's role in this movie is going to be somewhere like bigger than cameo, smaller than lead character. I'm going to guess somewhere around like the average involvement of Ned. Maybe maybe a little bit smaller than Ned would normally be involved. So that's going to be my guess for now. But who knows? I mean, maybe it'll be a lot less, maybe a lot, a lot more. We'll find out. Okay, next up. We've got K Spotted Bear who writes, one of three. Hey, John and crew. I've been watching from the AMC days. Thank you so much. When I was in high school. So I just watched The Last Duel. And I love the movie. I do agree about the pacing uh, uh, being a bit high back to low and back to high with the retelling of some spots. And I get that there are going, let me try this again. And I get what there, you mean there as in, you know, T-H-E-Y, Mark, Y-R-E. Yeah, anyway, I get what they're going to do in that kind of a courtroom trial thing. Not sure if that was the right call thematically, but I do get it, and I agree kind of crushes the pace. The whole idea of the movie, with no spoilers, uh, has we wanting to debate, which is great. Acting is super. Fights are fantastic. Sets are what we expect from Ridley and loved it. And feel this is a story that should be told, but when I heard it was $100 million to cost to make, I knew it wasn't likely going to make its money back, and sadly was right. Yeah, look, The Last Duel is certainly a movie that's come up a lot lately, and it's a Ridley Scott one. He's got these two big movies coming out back to back. He had The Last Duel, then he had House of Gucci come out like quickly afterwards, both of which I think are good. Um, I like The Last Duel, but again, to me, like he was pointing out, the whole you know, storytelling mechanic of retelling the events three different times from the perspective of three different characters. That is a mechanic that can and has worked very well in other films, but it, I didn't feel like the right mechanic for this film. And instead of adding to it, I felt like it just slowed the movie down a lot. And that was to the detriment of the film. Again, overall, I still, it was a movie I enjoyed. It was a great base story. The, the performances are fantastic. But again, something I thought could have been done a little bit better. And, and that is my main sticking point. So thanks for pointing that stuff out there, uh, K-Spotted. All right, next up. We also, oh, there's a, there's a bonus one. K-Spotted writes four of three. Uh, so my question is, to get Ridley Scott to be more positive at the box office, should he go in the route of an M. Night and find a smaller studio giving him more creative control, but with a tighter budget? Thanks, and bring out the breakdance cardboard. Well, number one, um, Ridley Scott has all the creative control in the world that he wants. He's Ridley Scott. There's nobody give. There's no studio giving Ridley Scott major important notes. Or making Ridley Scott do things in his movie that he does not want to do. When you're, there are very, very few directors at that level. Ridley Scott's at one of them, so that's not a problem. Also, when M Night like started doing things like, um, you know, Lady in the Water, he had a hundred percent creative control. Like that was back in the day when M Night was having Time Magazine writing art. Remember this? He was like on the cover of Time. I think it was Time Magazine. It might have been People, but let's say it was Time with the next Spielberg. And the problem is M. Night bought into his own press. And he, for a while, had 100% absolute creative control. And when, like, Disney wouldn't give him 100% creative control, he gave them the double efforts and he moved on from Disney. And it turns out that wasn't the right move. So, no, what Ridley Scott needs to do and what he continues to need to do is just make the best movies he can. That's it. Now, look, The Last Duel deserved better because it's a good movie. But, I mean, at the end of the day, that's all a director. A, a director can't worry about how much money his movie's going to make. That's not the director's job. The director's job is to make the best movie possible. Then, once the product is made, you hand it over to the, to the distributor, and the distributor and their marketing team, they are the ones who've got to sell it now. They're the ones who have to sell it. So I think what Ridley Scott needs to do is just keep doing what he's doing. Keep making the best movies he can and then let the studio and the distributors worry about how to sell it. That's my take on it at any rate. All right, next up. Not Kevin Feige writes, isn't Kang's suit just a quantum suit, but just purple? Also, I don't think Kang's face is blue. I think it's just the quantum suit that makes him look like that. Again, all that stuff is irrelevant because at the end of the day, what what is... 
We've talked about this a lot over and over and over again. It's absolutely irrelevant kind of what things are in the comics because nine times out of ten, Kevin Feige either slightly or significantly changes details from what is in the comics to the live action. So none of that is really kind of important. So all we are left with is that reflection, that bad blurry reflection in Ant-Man's helmet. And we'll see what he's actually going to do with that, uh, James. We'll see what he's going to do with that. Or uh, not Kevin Feige, I should say. All right, next up. Now let's go over to James. And James Lockman writes, What if the big surprise is Toby replacing Tom Holland? He's not. That's not even worth talking about. And is reprising his role as Spider-Man from this point forward? He's not. So that's that's just not even worth talking about. Or No Way Home makes it possible for Sony to make three separate Spider-Man films uh, with all three actors getting their own film. Now, nobody's going to do that. Uh, Marvel has no interest in that. There's no point in diluting the brand like that. So that's just not something they're going to go for, James. I don't think at all. All right. Spider-Man No Way. Oh, sorry. That's not the name, name of the person. Fanimator writes. Spider-Man No Way Home is now projecting to make 190 to 250 million in its opening weekend. Now it's important to note that is one source that is forecasting that. One source. And it's it's a good source, but it's only one source. Box Office Pro, their projections. And their projections for a long time have been 150 to 185, but they just adjusted their projections to 190 to 250, which is huge. Anyway, uh, 190 to 250 million in its opening weekend. This movie is going to be as big as The Force Awakens and Infinity War, not necessarily Endgame numbers. Are you now adjusting your projection from 170 million to higher? I'm actually going a little bit higher, but to 190. Uh, again, I t- we talked on the show today about this. I do not see Spider-Man No Way Home making 250. And it would have to come in at the top end of that range to get to Star Wars and Infinity War numbers. It's not going to come anywhere close to Endgame. But look, even if it makes 190, you are talking about, in a pandemic era, a movie cracking the top 10 of the biggest opening weekend box offices of all time. In a pandemic era. In an era where, as Variety wrote last week, 49% of regular moviegoers have not yet come back to the movie theater since the pandemic. If this movie can crack the top 10 Biggest opening weekends in the history of Hollywood during a pandemic. That is damn impressive. So I've adjusted my numbers up a bit, like, but it's closer to 190. So I think two 250 is too much of a stretch. I hope it does it. I hope to hear that many people are going back to the theaters. I, I'm going to love it if they do. My guess is they won't, but we'll see. So I'm, I'm going to stick around 190 for now. All right. Thanks for writing that in, Fanimator. Next up, we got Suthius and Suthius writes, what was the main constant between Homecoming and Far From Home? Tony. Well, I would say no was probably Peter, but there, or even more than Tony was probably uh, uh, happy. But anyway, um, Tony, you said yourself, Mr. C, that we would see him again. Uh, what if we see an alternate Tony who has lost his Peter? It could make for some great emotional storytelling with Peter leaving with him. Yeah, listen, I've said for a while that it would make thematic and narrative sense if a Tony appeared in the film, right? It would make narrative sense. Now, what is clear is that that's not what the movie would be about. Like what you're describing, a Tony who lost his Peter and now coming through, that's too big of a film right there when clearly that's not what this movie's going to be about. But can I see a Robert Downey Jr. as an alternate version of Tony Stark coming through? I could see it happening. I'm not predicting that it will. I'm not I'm not betting that it will. But I could theoretically see that happening because it would make narrative sense and it would be a nice little moment, to be honest with you. So, well, I mean, it probably won't happen, but again, I think it's a possibility. All right, next up. Too Close to Home writes, uh, have you seen the picture of a map of Puerto Rico next to a shot of the Spider of of the Spider Man No Way Home title revealed on the whiteboard. Yeah, we talked about that months ago. Uh, the web drawn around the movie name is basically an outline of the island of Puerto Rico. They could be hinting at Miles. Nah, I don't think so. I don't think Miles is a part of it at all. And even if Miles is a part of it, they wouldn't be giving that away in little announcements, stuff like that. So I I think that was more of a happy coincidence. But I don't know. Who knows? Anything's possible. But that came up before too, and we kind of said the same thing. So, but let's see. Never know. I mean, Kim certainly thinks they're going to have Miles in, so let's see. All right. Uh, Too Close to Home wrote, Happy birthday, Kim. Of course, it was Kim's birthday on Friday, so thanks for sending that in, Too Close to Home. Uh, Next up, Scott Brown writes, After three episodes, I've really enjoyed Hawkeye. I really like the personal nature of the series, following only them and their issues. 
The car chase scene with the trick arrow was a blast. Yeah, that that was a really good scene. This may not have the hype of the other series, but I'm enjoying it. Yeah, listen, I'll tell you what. I did not overall like Hawkeye episodes one and two. There were things about episodes one and two that I liked, but overall, you know, I didn't hate it, but it, I, I didn't like them either. Episode three started to turn things around for me. I thought episode three was a very strong episode of Marvel Disney Plus programming. I thought episode three was a very strong episode. It actually has me looking forward to the next episode, and I wasn't feeling that before. So it's heading in the right direction. So I, I'm there with you right now, Scott. All right, next up. We've got Obi Brahm Kenobi, who writes, just got tickets for Spider-Man on December 15th, 1 p.m. among the first in the world. So obviously you're in one of, you're not in the United States if you're seeing on the 15th. Uh, a back-to-back -back Matrix Resurrection screening and The King's Man. It's going to be, it's going to be a good end of the year. Wish I could have made your screening, but Belgium is a little bit far. Yeah, that is a little bit far. And listen, I, obviously I have not had a lot of excitement. I don't have excitement for The Matrix. Uh, and I've listed all my reasons why for months. So I don't need to say it again. But but I do got to say those trailers, including the newest one that came out today, remarkable trailers, really really top notch trailers. And so if I had no hope in this movie before, I maybe have a little bit of hope now. I'm still having a hard time getting excited for The King's Man just because the second Kingsman was such a letdown. I love the first movie, but the second one was a pretty big letdown. Let's see how this one turns out. All right, next up. We got a Knight Rider fan. A Knight Rider fan writes in, Hey, John, Kim, uh, Kim and Ray. Well, obviously, Kim and Ray aren't here right now. Uh, big surprises. Uh, just found your channel and now watch on the daily. Well, thank you so much for that, Knight Rider fan. Addicted. Your thoughts on Tom Spidey in No Way Home potentially getting killed at the end by one or all of the villains so Sony can reboot Spidey again over under 30%. I'm going to go well under that. Because while I do believe there is a really solid chance, I mean, it's come into question lately, to be honest with you, but I still believe there's a very, very good chance that Tom goes and Spider-Man go back over to the Sony-verse and probably travels back and forth because Kevin Feige did say that Spider-Man's going to be the one character that can travel in between cinematic universes. We'll see what that means. But I, I think there is no doubt they want to continue working with Tom. They want him to be Spider-Man. So because of that, it's not 0%, but I'm going to take well under 30 on that uh, for now. Anyway, thanks for being with us, man. And thanks for being a new joiner into our community, Knight Rider. Good to have you here, dude. All right, next up. Dangerous D writes, Hey, John. Warner Brothers is going to make animated Metal Men movie. We were just talking about that the other day. Uh, and have heavy hitters behind the scene. I don't know how heavy the hitters they are. Uh, Ron Clements and John Musker from Little Mermaid will produce, might direct. Uh, Celesta Ballad from Space Jam 2 will write the script. I've always talked about this, uh, about getting this to the big screen, because this might be the next Guardians of the Galaxy. I don't think it will be. Uh, there are B characters that have potential. Is being a sleeper hit. I'm not the only one. Barry uh, Sonfeld was in development to make a live action film, but no word on this thoughts. I, I'm honestly not paying much attention to it. Like, like with Guardians of the Galaxy, number one, big Marvel film, but number two, they got James Gunn. And if you guys have been following me long enough to remember when they first announced Guardians of the Galaxy, you know I got very excited, very excited when they announced that James Gunn was going to be directing that. I, I'm a, I had been a big fan of James Gunn. One of my all-time most underappreciated, underrated movies ever is James Gunn's Slither. To this day, I still think it's Gunn's best movie. And I love his Guardians films. I love what he did with Suicide Squad, all that stuff. But I still, to this day, think Slither is his best film. And I think one of the most underappreciated, underrated films ever made. Like right up there with Stardust and uh, and and uh, uh, Man of Steel and others. Like right up there. Slither is a, is a movie that probably many of you never saw. You absolutely much must watch Slither. You must. It's got a great cast of people that you'll love. You should go check that out. But yeah, it had that. I am not as excited about the idea that, ooh, it's the writer from Space Jam 2. Ooh, you know, the guy's producing Little Mermaid. Look, and I'm not trashing on them. I'm just saying they could do great work in this thing. I'm not saying their names 
make me pessimistic. I'm just saying like, there's not a track record there that makes me excited. So yeah, that's where I'm kind of at right now, but we'll see. Maybe it can be one of those sleeper hits. All right. Next up. We got Jeremy, uh, who tips in like $20. Thank you, Jeremy, for supporting us on that level, dude. That's very generous of you. And Jeremy writes, Hey, John, I fully understand the need for a theatrical only window. However, I live in a very rural area and I'm going to miss the day and date releases when it comes to an end. Love the show and appreciate you guys. So I, I, thanks for sending that in, Jeremy. And yeah, but look, here's the reality, though. The reality is it's not like you're not going to be able to see these movies. For the ones you really want to see, you know, you can hop in the car. I mean, I, I drove 2000 miles once just to watch a movie I wanted to see on my favorite movie theater screen. True story. I did. I drew, drove over 2000 miles just so I could watch it on my favorite movie screen. So if there's a movie you're super excited about, I'm sure there's going to be a, a theater within driving range. <laughs> like that's not 2000 miles, but otherwise eh, you got to wait 45 days. No biggie. I mean, it's not like the old days when it was a 90-day theatrical window. Uh, now it's a 45-day theatrical window for most films. So you really don't have to wait all that long to check them out. So you're right. I mean, it, it does suck for people in that situation. But for the majority of people that are out there, I mean, the theatrical thing is still the best thing to do. It's needed to keep the movie industry alive, not just the theater. It's to keep the movie, the movie industry to survive needs the theatrical exhibition. There's no money to be made otherwise. And so that's what the thing is. And, and so, yeah, the good news is you can make a drive for the big ones you're really excited about. For the other ones, it's, it's less, it's only half the weight now that it used to be. So that's the good news. So, but yeah, I'm not going to lie to you, man. It's easier for me to say because I live in the LA area. So I got a plethora of movie theaters at my fingertips whenever I want. So I, I get that. But, but again, at least it's not like the older days where it was a 90-day theatrical window. All right, thanks a lot for saying that in, Jeremy. Really appreciate that, man. All right, and you sharing your situation. All right, Dangerous D writes, Hi, John. According, according to Bloomberg, Hellboy slash Sin City publisher Dark Horse Comics hired an advisor to weigh options that could see the sale of the company. There are no details at this time, but it seems that there could be potentially buyers like Netflix, Disney, and even Warner Brothers. Yeah, I don't know if I see either any of them picking up. I think it would probably be another type of company if it does. A really good friend of mine is an executive at Dark... Actually, a guy, buddy who plays in my Star Wars role-playing game group is actually an executive over at Dark Horse and a producer on Umbrella Academy and things like that. So uh, I'll, I'll ask him about it, see what he thinks about it. All right, next up. Uh, Rainmaker23 writes, Hey, John. First time donating? Well, thank you so much for that, Rainmaker. Appreciate that, man. About Sony, about Sony only showing 40 minutes of No Way Home. I'm 99% sure Marvel did the same for Infinity War and Endgame. I do not believe they did. I don't believe they did. So it's not only it's not completely unprecedented, and especially considering the recent Eternals and Venom 2 screening leaks. Now, I, I really don't think so. I mean, I was covering the industry when Infinity War and Eternals came out, and there were no 30 or 40 minute screenings of footage. It they they showed us the movies. Maybe there were territories that only got part of the movie. But I think for the most part, it was that. And the reality is 95% of leaks that come out of those screenings were not from the press. They usually come from other places. Um, so, so, yeah, I don't know. So it's a very, very, very odd situation with that, Rainmaker. Very, very odd situation with that. All right. Next up, we got Russ Childress who writes, with them only showing 40 minutes of Spider-Man to the interviewers, what do you think the chances are that one of the big twists is Tom Holland's Spider-Man dies in this movie? Uh, it, that it has no bearing on it. Because honestly, if that was the twist that they've tried to hide, then all you have to do is not show five minutes of it, right? You don't have to hold back an hour and 50 minutes of it. All you'd have to do is not show five minutes. So honestly... I mean, look, Tom dying at the end is a possibility, but them only screening like 40 minutes of the movie for the journalists doesn't increase the chances of that at all. Cause that's only something you have to hide five minutes of the film from not an hour and 50 minutes of, you know what I'm saying? All right. Thanks for sending that in Russ. Next up, we've got dangerous D who writes, Hey John, 
With the Omicron uh, variant ripping through South Africa, reports say that the variant was linked to someone who traveled South Africa and returned to California. Are you concerned of a shutdown again until we develop a vaccine that boosts our immunity to this variant? Uh, I, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not really going to be addressing many of these questions anymore about Omicron. Look, I've said before, as long as the pandemic is still happening, there is always a risk of there having to be another shutdown if people let their guard down, right? But other than that, I'm not, a, I don't have, unlike a, half the people on the internet who think looking up a Google article or two makes them infectious disease experts, public service announcement, you're not. Um, I know I am not a infectious diseases expert, so I'm really not going to comment on that. Other than to say that I've always felt as long as the pandemic is still around, there is always a possibility that it could get out of control again and that we're going to have to shut things down again. So there's that. All right. Chapex Hitman writes, Hey, John and co. I've been listening to your show at work since WandaVision. Thank you so much. Uh, we all know John is Mephisto. The blurry leaked images, Reddit confirmations, and that little red flame in John's eyes confirm it. Uh, getting more serious, given the tragic loss of Chadwick Boseman and his iconic portrayal, I think Marvel should recast. I understand why they decided against it, but we've only scratched the surface of the T'Challa character and his story thoughts. Well, look, I mean, it's, it's not going to come as any surprise to any of you guys who watch me regularly. I have said forever, the right thing to do was to recast the role of T'Challa. The right thing to do is to carry on the legacy of Chadwick Boseman and this incredibly socially important character that he has created and brought to life. And they have only just scratched the surface of the T'Challa, the T'Challa's character's story. The right thing to do is to not let the legacy of the character die. The right thing to do is to pick up the ball for Chadwick Boseman and carry it on in his name. That is what they should have done. And I, I am with you. I don't blame them for deciding to move away from it. I understand their reasoning and their reasoning is from a place of them wanting to honor Chadwick. And I respect that. It's just that it's the wrong decision. The, the right decision to honor Chadwick is to carry on with the character, to pick up the baton for him and carry forth the legacy that he has created. And it, it makes for the better for the movies as well. All of a sudden now T'Challa is not there. And I just don't think that was the right move. I don't think that was the right move, but it is the move they have decided on. And I'm, and, you know, I'm sure they're going to do a very good job moving forward, but anyway, uh, hindsight, right? But I am with you on that JPEX hit, man. I, I am actually with you on that. Okay. Next up, we've got dangerous D who writes, Hey, John, I got slug fest on audible. That's great. I've been encouraging people to check it out. I'm still listening to it. I'm in chapter three. So far, the books uh, more for Marvel and they're, and they're in tune with the readers uh, while DC are stuffy old men who hold to old traditional ways of doing business. That's my take so far. Am I wrong? Never develop a take when you're too early into a book. Remember, this is a book that covers several eras of the history of Marvel and DC, right? Like one era will come across making one a little bit more flattering. Another era will make another one look a little bit more flattering. So I, I wouldn't try to be passing too many assessments when you're just three chapters in at this point. Just keep going and I'm sure you're going to enjoy, man. All right, next up. Uh, uh, Araham writes, Abraham writes, one of two. Hey, y'all, just rewatched Far From Home as prep for No Way Home and had a thought. What if one of the big surprises uh, is that Toby is the MCU's Uncle Ben? I'm sure you've heard this theory, but I can't help but think this has potential for adding more weight than just having him there because of multiverse stuff. But in Feige and team, I trust, and I'm very hyped either way for what they've got planned. Now, I might be wrong about this, uh, Abraham, and thank you for sending that in. But I think I remember a while ago, somebody asking Tobey Maguire if he'd ever want to play Uncle Ben. And I think he definitively said he wouldn't be interested in that. You know what I'm saying? But it does stand as a possibility. But I would also say this. It would come across as very awkward and weird if like Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man came back and then Tobey Maguire's in the movie, but as Uncle Ben. If there was no Andrew Garfield, then just having Tobey Maguire's Uncle Ben is fine. But again, it's, it creates a big awkwardness when you have Doc Ock there and the guy who played his Spider-Man there also, but he's not actually Spider-Man. He's just an Uncle Ben. So that doesn't actually work for me. I was always been open to the idea 
of having an Uncle Ben character in Tom Holland's movies and it be play, being played by Tobey Maguire, but not in a thing where you're going to be crossing over the other universes anyway. That just creates an awkwardness, I think. So, But you never know, man. We'll have to wait and see how they handle it. Thanks for sending that in, dude. All right, next up. Remmer Bulldog writes, Rewatching all the Spider-Man live action movies to get me really high. Let me try this again. Rewatching all the Spider-Man live action movies to get me really high. First, No Way Home. Also, the villains, especially Electro, look really formidable. Uh, do you think that Tom Holland's Spider-Man will fight each of them individually one-on-one -on -one first? And it's possible. Like, I read a lot of people saying, oh, well, that Spider-Man could never take on those villains. Uh, depending who's writing it, sure he can. If you write it a certain way, listen, if you can write a movie or a comic book story where Batman beats Superman, then don't tell me that Tom Holland's Spider-Man can't possibly stand up to Electro and Sandman and, and uh, Lizard. Yeah, he can. I mean, if I was writing it, it, those three combined are probably too much for him to handle. But another writer could easily write that way. Again... In a creative literary world where you can write either in comic book format or in movie format, Batman defeating Superman, then you can have a superpowered Spider-Man taking on three villains. You could do that. But I don't know if they'll show him taking them on individually first. Maybe. Maybe. But we'll have to wait and see. But that's a good thought, Remmer. All right. Next up. Uh, Chloe Fanning writes. Not sure if anyone else has acknowledged this, but actress Kira Allen, for the first time in 70 years, has become the second actor to take on a main role, being a wheelchair user. In a show called Anesh Chang Auntie, Cha Chang Auntie's Run, which hits Netflix Canada on April 2nd. I have obviously, I've never heard of either Kira, uh, Kira Allen that I can remember, nor have I ever heard of this show. But I, I can think of several, like there was a, a sci-fi show, a sh a sci but I when I say sci-fi, I mean the sci-fi network. There was a sci-fi network show about a team of like heroes and they were, and it wasn't X-Men, but they were led by a dude in a wheelchair. Obviously you had Patrick Stewart as Professor Charles Xavier in a wheelchair. Now, I don't know if you mean by actual performers who are themselves wheelchair users. That I don't know. That's interesting. So something we'll keep our eye on. Thanks for putting that on our radar, Chloe. All right, next up. Andres Gutierrez writes, Hey, John, Ray and Kim, and obviously Ray and Kim aren't here right now. First time writing in. Thank you so much, Andres. Um, this year, I finally gave in and started using Spotify. I just got my stats, and you are my most streamed podcast with 8,629 minutes uh, between 86 episodes. P.S. I really enjoyed watching your ticket botch. Oh, the ticket watch. 2021. You know what's funny, Andres? It is Really weird, I, I not weird, but really cool, how many people have been, and I mentioned this on the show the other day too, how many people have been writing in to tell me, because I never even knew Spotify did this, writing in to tell me saying, Spotify just sent out my annual stats and you're my number one listen to podcast. I had no idea Spotify did that, but it's really cool to hear from so many of you guys tell me that you've had that experience and that is an honor. So thank you so much for sharing that with me, man. I appreciate it a lot. All right, next up, we got Christopher Rosado who writes, so, as I am writing this, it's December 4th, so this would have been after fr the last show on Friday. Uh, that means it's 12 days from No Way Home opening night and nine days from the premiere. Do you still have faith that there is a new trailer coming out, or do you think that it's too late now? I said this morning, I'll still say again, I obviously don't know if there's going to be a new trailer, but I still believe there is going to be one more big trailer before the show. I'm thinking about a week out from premiere, so maybe... I don't know, maybe Thursday or Friday. I'm thinking maybe Thursday or Friday there's going to be a new trailer. I, can't, I I don't know that. I'm not willing to bet money on it, but I still feel like there's going to be a Spider-Man No Way Home final trailer because we haven't had one of those yet, so I still think we're going to get it, but we'll find out. All right, next up, we got Dangerous D who writes, Hey, John, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, uh, he has a segment, Meanwhile. In it, he says a scientist from Georgia Tech has discovered a major plot hole in the Marvel movie, Thanos couldn't possibly do the snap while wearing a glove. Kevin Feige must be alerted ASAP. I haven't watched that, so I have no idea what even the context of that is. Obviously, it's being facetious, but I, I don't even know what the context of the joke is, so I can't obviously comment on it, unfortunately. All right, Film Boss writes, The Batman is out in only three months. It's getting close. Are you With all the Spider-Man hype, 
deservedly so, all the Spider-Man hype. Spider-Man's going to be done, and then we're going to go, Oh, wait, the Batman's only like two and a half months away. Like, it's getting close. Anyway, it's finally nearly upon us. Pretty exciting. Film boss, it is more than pretty exciting. I am super hyped for this movie. The trailers have been fantastic. You have an awesome director. You have an awesome lead star. You have a great supporting cast. And again, the trailers have been spectacular so far. I'm very stoked about it. All right. Static Space Sean writes, do you think Sony is purposefully teasing slash hiding Toby and Andrew to keep the focus on them and away from other surprises? It's definitely a possibility. You know, now look, they're not may there may not be nearly as many big surprises, as Ray would say, as we think there might be. Like I've been saying for a while, I think there are gonna be surprises in this thing that we're not even thinking about. Well, that's possible, but it's also possible that there's not. They're really the big surprise is the surprise we've all known about for a year, which is Toby and Andrew are going to be in it. Now, according to the comments from Kevin Feige today, it sounds like Charlie Cox is probably going to be in it. So maybe there's nothing else hugely surprising other than that. Or maybe there is. Maybe that's exactly what they're doing, Static Space. What you're suggesting could exactly be what they're doing. We'll find out in just 10 days. Or sorry. Yeah, 10 days. 10 days from now, we will find out. All right, next up. Ugly Bob writes, So, John. Uh, so far, only Goblin Electro and OC, I don't know what that means, have been majorly marketed for No Way Home. Uh, Sandman and Lizard have only, oh, OC mean Ock, okay, um, have been majorly marketed for No Way Home. Sandman and Lizard have only been glimpses in trailers. Can this be an Infinity War situation where they aren't in the movie and it's other villains instead? Thoughts? Possible. What I did think was interesting was in that villain panel the other day, I think it was only Jamie Foxx, uh, Alfred Molina, and Willem Dafoe. I don't think like Thomas Hayden Church or Riza Fans were there. I could be wrong about that. I'd have to double check. But it could be that they're only in a very small part of the movie. Maybe their characters are there, but we don't actually see them in their actor form. Or maybe it's just one big misdirect. Maybe it is a big misdirect. It's po I mean, I don't think that's likely, Ugly Bob, to be honest with you. I don't think it's likely. But is it possible? Sure. It's possible. It, that would be pretty fun if they did. All right. Next up. Jack Lumbers writes, one of two. John, I would like your advice. I'll see what I can do. I was really excited when WWE announced in April that next WrestleMania will be within driving distance of my house. Less than one hour drive. However, throughout the year, WWE has released tons of wrestlers, including a lot of my favorite wrestlers like Keith Lee, John Morrison, uh, Ruby Riot, Braun Strowman, and especially Daniel Bryant and his friend Bray Wyatt. Would you still go if it was you? Look, the reality is I don't watch, I hardly watch wrestling anymore. Like I used to watch wrestling a lot, like over a decade ago. I used to watch it a lot, especially in the Attitude Era. That's when I that's when I mostly watched wrestling, from when I was a kid all the way up to the Attitude Era. I know who Bray Wyatt is. Obviously, he he was very popular and thing. But these days, I usually only watch two or three wrestling events a year. Like I'll watch WrestleMania every year, maybe a SummerSlam, maybe a Survivor Series. Those are really the ones that I'll watch. And watches Anna and Corey watch more than I do. But look, if you like WWE. Then go see what the next round of superstars are. Like, yeah, maybe they took out some of your favorite things. Like, look, if I was going to a Toronto Maple Leaf hockey game, I mean, I don't know, just because like Matthews is out, that doesn't mean I don't want to go to the game. I still want to go see the Toronto Maple Leafs. It's unfortunate that, you know, my favorite player may not be there, but I'll still go see the game. Right? So if you are a fan of wrestling, I'd say still go. I'd say still go. But again, I'm not the right guy to ask because I don't watch wrestling nearly as much as I used to. All right, next up. Rude Kaiser writes, why do you think some people has a problem with a staring, starring superhero being a complete dumbass like Iron Fist and Kate Bishop? I figure it's like ability issue. I got the impression it's just fool's mentality compared to something like greed or selfish. I'll be honest with you, Rude Kaiser. I have no, that made no, what you wrote just made no sense to me. 
Why do you think some people have a problem with starring superhero being a complete dumbass like Iron Fist and Kate Bishop? I understand that part of the question. I figure it's like ability issue. I got the impression it's just fool's mentality compared to something like greed or selfish. Again, I have no idea what you're asking, but I can address the first part. It is very difficult. I said this back when um, uh, Snake Eyes came out, right? Starring uh, Golding. I, I love him. I think he's great. Henry Golding. He's wonderful. I love him. So I was excited about that Snake Eyes movie. But Snake Eyes in the movie is a completely unlikable character. Like, he's actually the villain of the film. Snake Eyes is actually the bad guy in the movie. And Storm Shadow is actually one getting totally screwed. And when your main character is completely unlikable, it makes it difficult to get connected to him. And if it's if you're not connected to the main character, it's hard to get connected to the movie as an audience member. And so I think, yeah, I think that's why... And the unlikability of your main hero or the likability of your main hero is hugely important. So, yes, I think that's probably why, Rude Kaiser. I think that's probably why. I think you touched on it there. I think that's probably why a lot of people have issues with that. All right. Next up, we got Spud Quinn who writes, I live a half hour from Seattle and an AMC close to me is showing The Matrix 1999 in IMAX on December 7th. That's great. My partner and I haven't seen it, so we got tickets. Dude, that is fantastic. Very excited to be able to experience it for the first time this way. Thanks for all you do and bring on the filthy. Well, first of all, listen, Seattle's a great area. That's wonderful. But listen, the fact that you haven't seen Matrix yet and you now get before the new movie opens to go and see it, not just for the first time, but see it on the big screen for the first time. That is awesome. I hope you have a great time. It is an all-time classic movie. I hope you enjoy yourself, and uh, it'll get you all prepped up for Matrix 4 coming out. All right, thanks for sharing that, Spud. I'm very excited for you, man. All right, next up, Scott Brown writes, In my opinion, this is my top seven new animated series from the past couple of years. Number seven, Harley Quinn. Love it. Number six, Undone. Not familiar with it. Number five, Blood of Zeus. Eh, I thought Blood of Zeus was okay. Number four, Invincible. Invincible's great. Number three, Castlevania. I'm not nearly as into Castlevania as my wife is, but I still liked it. Number two, Arcane. Number one, Primal. I liked Primal. I liked what they were going for. I didn't think it was nearly as good as a lot of people do, though. But you're not alone, Scott Brown. Like, a lot of people love Primal. And I thought it was definitely visionary, but uh, to me, Arcane is the best. But at any rate, to me, these shows have shown what's possible with adult animation. Here's the thing, Scott. What I think it has shown is that what is possible with the medium. Too many people for too many years, including most fans consider the medium being limiting. Like if you're going to use this medium of storytelling, animation, then you can only tell certain types of stories. Well, we're finding out that the medium is just the medium. You can still tell whatever kind of story you want. And you can tell deeper, wider, incredibly interesting narratives with great deep characters. You can do that in the medium of animation. It's all about how the artist decides to use this, Scott. So I, I completely, I'm right on board there with you with that. I am totally on board. Not necessarily adult, but mature. You can tell deeper stories in the medium. It's just a medium. It's all about how you choose to use it. And you can use it for great kids' entertainment, but you can also use it just to great to create great stories. And we're seeing in a lot of these examples that you can do that. All right, next up. The Scumbag of New York writes, I watched Tick, Tick, Boom the other day, and dear God, it's amazing. It really is quite good. Uh, the most emotional experience I've had watching a film in ages. The only downside, it's impossible to find in a theater. True. Uh, shows how even dramas benefit from the cinematic experience. Yeah, listen, I really enjoyed Tick, Tick, Boom. I liked it a lot. Now, I, I'm somebody who appreciates a good musical movie when it's good. Andrew Garfield maybe gives the performance of his lifetime. Lin-Manuel Miranda shows he can direct music not just on a stage like in Hamilton, but also in a, uh, in a screen format. But you're right. I remember Ann and I even talked about it afterwards. It's like, that would have been an amazing experience on the big screen. I mean, seeing it on your TV, great, whatever. But 
it would have been an even better experience to have it on a truly big screen in a theater with that sound and with an audience. It would have been it would have been so much better. It was still great the way it was. I really enjoyed Tick, Tick, Boom. I thought it was great and I enjoyed it immensely. But I agree with you. It would have been a better experience in a movie theater. I would have liked it even more, I think. But that's just me. All right. Thanks for sharing that, man. All right. We got time for a couple more here. Next up comes to us from an anonymous viewer who writes, I rewatched all three Fast 4, F4, I don't, oh, Fantastic 4. Guys, please don't use abbreviations. Anyway, I rewatched all three Fantastic 4 movies. Two of them left Disney+. Plus. Notice the actor that played Doom first went on to play jo uh, Jonah in Run Runaways. Equally mad role, in my opinion. I actually really liked him in Runaways. I, I really enjoyed that show. Anyway, but the actor who played Doom in the reboot now plays Sean in Servant. Awesome. What do you think? Yes. So, okay. What we know is this. So the guy who played Dr. Doom in those first two Fantastic Four, mo uh, Fantastic, Fantastic Four movies, Julian McMahon. So he, he was already a big, successful actor from one of the biggest shows during its era, which was Nip Tuck. So that was a huge one. And by the way, Aaron Cummings, our own Aaron Cummings, who will be back soon. Remember, they, her and Tom just had a baby, so she's going to be off for a little bit, but she'll be back. But Aaron Cummings actually did a few episodes of Nip Tuck in which she was with Julian, and I think she had like a sex scene with him too or everything like that. So there's that. And now he's got like a, a successful franchise with the FBI franchise i think is on cbs right now so he's doing well with that then in the other one you had jamie bell and we were just talking about jamie bell a little bit earlier today he's got that other fred astaire project coming at the same time so yeah listen these fantastic four movies have had some really good uh character have some really good performers in them like some really really good performers in these fantastic four movies it's just unfortunate that they you know haven't exactly worked out the way everybody wanted them to work out all right Next up, uh, we've got Suthius who writes, uh, this is the tale of Captain Jack Sparrow, pirate so brave on the seven seas, a mythical quest to the Isle of Tortuga, Ravenlock sway on the ocean breeze. This is the only Lonely Island song I listen to. Love the beat. Bolton is great. If you listen, by the way, I love a lot of Lonely Island. Uh, whether it's Dick in a Box or I Just Had Sex or Jizz in My Pants or whatever. They are great. They make a lot of great, great, great songs. But yes, Captain Jack Sparrow is probably the best one with Michael Bolton. It's probably the best music video they've done too. But, but Jizz My Pants is also right up there too. I don't know, but they make a lot of good stuff. I love Lonely Island. All right, next up. Dan writes, hey, John. Um, so where are we at here? Yeah. Hey, John. So one of the reasons why Spider-Man 3 and The Amazing Spider-Man 2 were bad films was because there was too much going on such as villains, etc. Do you think Far From Home can face a similar situation where it can become too much for just one movie? By the way, Dan, I completely disagree. I completely disagree. There are other movies that are great that have a lot more going on with them than, say, Spider-Man 3 did or The Amazing Spider-Man 2. It's all about, is your filmmaker skilled enough or having a good enough day at the office? Because even the best directors can have a bad day at the office. Sam Raimi's a great director. Spider-Man 3 was his bad day at the office, right? I mean, even Steven Spielberg, the greatest director of all time, even he has had a bad day at the office or two, right? That was his. But it's about how do you handle what it is you're trying to accomplish. There are a lot of movies with a lot of characters and more, far more characters than those movies had with a lot of moving parts that were able to do them successfully. It's not about do you have too much stuff in it. It's about how do you navigate the stuff that you are doing. Again, Eternals had like 10 main characters, and it's great in my opinion. The original X-Men movie had more characters than some of these Spider-Man films. It's great. It kind of birthed the whole modern comic book movie movement. How many characters were in Endgame? How many characters were in Infinity War? How many characters were in Captain America Winter Soldier? You know, look, there were a Civil War, I should say. Tons, tons of characters with a lot going on. It's all about how you manage it. So no, I disagree that the reason those movies were bad is because they had too much going on. No, they came across as bad because the stuff they had going on wasn't managed properly and they didn't tell the story in the right way. There is a way to do it. Other movies have had more going on and done a great job at it. It's just that they didn't do it with those films and that's what the bottom line is to me. So it's going to be the same thing with No Way Home. 
if No Way Home is bad, it's because they didn't come up with a good way to tell their story. It's not going to be because they had a bunch of characters. It'll be, they could have three characters. We've seen a lot of movies with very few characters and they're terrible. It's not because they have few characters, just they didn't tell the story well. And that's what it's going to come down to for Spider-Man No Way Home as well. At least in my opinion, Dan. All right, thanks for writing that in. All right, next up, Austin F. writes, Hey, the John Campia Show crew. Uh, that thing you did, asking Kobe Smulders uh, the first question, really made me smile that day. John, you're a guy. You're a real guy. On another note, buy one, rent one, lose one. Mission Impossible Fallout. No Time to Die or Fast Five. Ooh. You know what? I'm going to skip that one. I I mean, that's one I'd have to think about. I, I would, I'd have to give a, long, a lot of time to think about. Look, I really like No Time to Die, but that one would be the lose one, even though I really like it. It's not even the best in the Bond in the Daniel Craig Bond franchise. It's not even the second best Daniel Craig era Bond movie. Like that's Casino Royale and Skyfall, and then would be No Time to Die. So that one, since it's not even in the top two of its own actors franchise, I would say it's not in the top two in here. But to rank the other two, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. All right. Next up, uh, Dangerous D writes. Person smart, uh, peep, uh, person smart, people are dumb, uh, panicky, dangerous animals. Oh, this is um, um, this is Men in Black. Um, dangerous animals, and you know it. 1,500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was flat. And like 15 minutes ago, you knew people were alone on this planet. Yep, that's from uh, Tommy Lee Jones in, uh, in um, uh, Men in Black. That's what that one's from. All right, next up, uh, Nate Dog writes. One of three. Hello, John. I like how in MCU shows, being a superhero isn't just about having all the glory. They show the real price of that superheroes pay for being who they are. We saw it in Falcon and the Winter Soldier when Bucky was forced to face uh, the loved ones uh, of the people he killed. And now with Hawkeye, as he faces his physical disabilities and the alienation from his family. One thing I love about Hawkeye is the juxtaposition between what people perceive of the superhero as shown in the musical and the reality of Hawkeye's situation in the phone call with his son. That's why the MCU has been so successful for so long. They show us that there is a price to pay for what we do, including our heroes. It's not just all rainbows. Well, see, I don't know, I, I don't know that I would say that that's why the MCU is successful. Because... There was a long time when they didn't really show that side of it. And, and they're not the only ones who does it. Like, like the DC movies have shown that as well. You know, one of the criticisms, which I've never thought was a fair criticism of the DCU, is that it's too dark. You know, the, the consequences and, and the, the toll and the scars weigh on the super, on the heroes too much. And I, I don't, I don't think that's it at all. I mean, I think that is a very positive trait uh, in, in recent MCU stuff, particularly the examples you're bringing up. I like, I love it when movies and shows show us the audience that there are consequences, even personal and otherwise, whether it's emotional or physical, to the actions these heroes have to take. And I like it when they highlight that. And that's one of the things that I really like about Hawkeye, even the first two episodes. Like, I didn't like the first two episodes, but one of the things I really did appreciate about those first two episodes was the fact that they showed us Hawkeye struggling with both emotional scars over the Black Widow loss and his physical scars being just a regular human being trying to deal with all this stuff. So I think that's been a pretty big thing uh, there as well. All right, guys. And that'll do it for this installment of the companion video. Now listen, there are still more questions to come from uh, Daniel Lyons and others, but do not worry. We will pick up right where we left off here on the John Campion show tomorrow with the next question coming to us from Daniel Lyons. And we will pick up right there. But for now, that'll do it for this installment of the companion videos. Thank you so much guys for being here and making this video a part of your evening. Just want to remind you guys and thank you guys so much for those of you who sent in the questions. Number one, because you gave us great fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported our channel as you sent them in and all of us involved with the John Campy show. Thank you guys so much with all of our gratitude for that support. Okay, guys, don't forget to join us tomorrow for the next episode of the John Campy show. Going to be talking about, oh my gosh, so much stuff going on. Shang-Chi 2 got announced. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about 
Uh, oh, guys, there's a whole bunch of things we've got to listed out. Come on back and join us tomorrow. But that'll do it for us for now, guys. My name's John Campia. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye. <laughs>